Okay, we have, um, it's, it's noon, um, and uh, uh, early in January, so it's still uh, uh, proper to wish everybody a happy new year, happy 2019. Uh, this is our first uh, of, in the series of the William K. Warren Foundation of Neuroscience Talks, and uh, I'm very excited to uh, have uh, Dr. Carol Taminga uh, join us today. Um, Dr. Taminga um, received her, a medical degree from uh, the uh, from Vanderbilt University, and then she uh, completed uh, a residency training program at the University of Chicago. Uh, she then went on to uh, go to the National Institute uh, of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, stayed there for quite some time, and then uh, since 2003 has been in uh, uh, Texas at UT Southwestern. And really, uh, she currently is the chair um, at UT Southwestern um, and has really had remarkable influence in the field of psychosis research. Uh, from my perspective, the most notable, I mean, she has many, many accolades um, and, and has really uh, had impact on all levels. The things that uh, has struck me the most is she's been one of the founding uh, members of the International Congress of Schizophrenia Research which has really become one of the premier meeting for uh, schizophrenia research across the world um, and uh, has brought a very, really a broad range of researchers together. And for uh, a number of years, I used to go regular to the meeting and it was the, the scientific quality was just tremendous. Um, but beyond that, I think that um, what, what really strikes me with uh, Dr. Taminga is she's been trying to understand um, what is really at the heart of what we call schizophrenia, um, and how can we use that knowledge uh, to develop better and uh, more efficient treatments? Um, and over the last few years, and we've heard uh, other speakers talk about this, it, there's been sort of a revolution of how we think about psychiatric disorders um, in terms of uh, not just a specific diagnosis, but in terms of range of dysfunctions. And uh, again, Dr. Domingo has been at the forefront in uh, trying to uh, create an empirical basis for, for the improved understanding of psychosis. Um, she's um, one of the principal investigators of the uh, uh, B-SNP study, which is a, a, a large-scale study of bipolar and schizophrenia patients with a very detailed assessments of these patients um, in order to really try to uh, tease apart the biology um, that underlies uh, these disorders. So uh, I think it's very fitting that we have somebody who is so, um, who has contributed so profoundly to psychosis and uh, schizophrenia research opening up for 2019 WKW Foundation Lectures. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And Martin has given me an opportunity to not only say um, Happy New Year, um, but also to acknowledge the role of the William K. Warren Foundation in the International Congress of Schizophrenia Research because the William K. Warren Foundation was one of the founding sponsors of that meeting. Um, and it's it morphed a little bit over time, but we certainly appreciated it. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is, um, um, so I titled this likely, is it schizophrenia or, or is it psychosis? And perhaps none of you really care about that. Um, but the the dimension of schizophrenia has been divided in these um, the different uh, different uh, named uh, the diagnoses by the DSM, and in some people's mind, these individual categories of diagnosis have really impeded research. So we wanted to really see if we took all of these different dimensions, all these different diseases that we sometimes think of as diseases, and if you put them side by side and examine these people biologically, um, what would we see? Would we see that there were, um, well, I'll tell you how the story developed over time. Whoops. I have some disclosures. I, I am on, I'm a consultant for these companies here, all of which are um, making new and very interesting uh, medications for the treatment of psychosis. All these medications are actually antipsychotic medicines. They're not anti-schizophrenic medica medications. Um, I've been very, um, I've been very uh, lucky to be part of a big group of 
psychosis investigators around the country that you see here. The ones on the top are the five PIs of the BSNP study, and we're raising a middle level of people and have to have a big uh, group of young people um, that we're bringing along in the area of psychosis, and it's all gotten very interesting. And this is the story that I'll start with today, and then I'll get you into a little bit more of my own research. Clearly, there are people, there are people who work in the field who are clinicians and think about clinical diseases and notice that psychosis is really a dimension of psychopathology that you can see in many different diseases. It's not only, it's not that psychosis is limited to psychotic bipolar disorder or limited to schizophrenia. You get uh, psychosis in many different brain disorders, neurologic and psychiatric together. It was Nancy Andreasen some number of years ago who first call, called different, who first used the term biotype, and you'll see the significance of this term uh, uh, soon, and drew attention to the idea that what we had to measure things about the brain. Like when you think about the heart, you measure heart rate, you measure um, um, the strength of the cardiac, um, um, I'm not a cardiologist, excuse me, the strength with which the, the heart uh, pumps blood, you, for the peripheral resistance and things like that. We, had, we just don't ha have that much in psychiatry. And um, this is how the idea um, ev evolved for, um, for, for this particular study that I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you. So schizophrenia is a diagnosis, schizoaffective disorder is a diagnosis, psychotic bipolar a diagnosis. We understood that there were areas, there were areas of overlap in the middle spaces. Um, we did not start out to really show that there were, these were not diseases. We started out with the idea that, um, we started out with the idea that when somebody comes in a, a doctor's office with psychosis, what we wanted to generate was some intermediate phenotypes, some measures we could do of the brain, EEG, brain imaging, that, that we could use to make the diagnosis. We knew there would be some that would fall in between diagnoses, but we were counting on having one or two of these fall on schizophrenia, one or two of these call, uh, fall on schizoaffective, one or two of these to fall on bipolar disorder. Um, so that when a patient walked into your office, psychiatrists um, sit down and talk to the patient for an hour. When, a, when somebody with, a, um, with a, a, a neurological disorder walks into a, a neurologist's office, they sit down and talk for 10 minutes, and then the neurologist sends them out for two weeks of testing, and then they come back and they get a diagnosis. That's what we were looking for. We were looking for this two weeks of testing. Um, the, the idea also was that these intermediate phenotypes would fall differentially onto schizophrenia and that genes then would be attached to these intermediate phenotypes. I show this um, um, hypothetical picture here because this was how we started out with this study. I'm going to report to you, but I'll just say in anticipation that what we found was something entirely different than this. But I just wanted to show you how, you could, how wrong you can be at the beginning, but work at it carefully and collect good data and then correct yourself by the end. So this is a page of data, and I'm just going to direct you only to this line right up here. So this study, this BSNP, this first BSNP study, um, included uh, three different groups of psychotic probands, and they were. About, th this is, adds up to about a thousand probands, and there's about one third, one third, one third of each of the diagnosis. A thousand of their relatives, one relative per bipolar disorder per people and about 450 normal controls. So it used to be, before I did this study, it used to be that I did studies with, um, well, I was pretty happy when I broke into double digits in the study. So that 20 or 30 or 40 seemed like a huge number. Now, in fact, we're on BSNP2, not even BSNP1 anymore, and we're headed up to 3,000 probands, not just 1,000 probands. And it really goes to show what you can do with more power, um, uh, with more power in your study. So what do we actually measure? These um, thousand probands, these thousand family members, and the normal controls, um, we collect these clinical measures, um, SCID, medication, lifetime history, symptom scales. We, didn't do the, we did not do the symptom scales in normals. A psychosocial scale, personal and family history, personality inventory. Um, so these were collected on each of the people, and then we collected some of these biomarker measures, or whatever you want to call them, phenotypic measures. We looked at cognition, 
We did uh, backs, um, and then we, um, we did others, other computerized tests in addition to the backs. We looked at eye movements. We looked at EEG, both resting state and evoked potential. We looked at MRI, mostly in this, in this um, study, mostly structural MRI. Um, we looked at resting state, fMRI, and its connectivity, DTI. Then we drew blood for DNA, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. We had, we've begun some plasma immune measures, and we've taken, in many of these, but not all of them, we've taken um, little dermal biopsies, and we take those dermal biopsies and grow them into fibroblasts, and then you can take these fibroblasts. If you've read in the newspaper lately these, um, the, the results of these, uh, um, these kinds of um, uh, neuroprogenitor cell studies, they're, they're quite interesting. And we, I have started to grow them ourselves. I haven't found any. It, it'll take a long time. Now I could, so all of these, the, these, are the, these are the measures that we had been hoping would diagnose schizophrenia, would diagnose bipolar, would diagnose schizoaffective <clears throat> disorder. I could, we've worked up all of these data for our very first vSNP1 database, as has, as has Martin, who's gotten the vSNP1 database and helped us with the analysis also. I won't, um, I won't uh, bother you with the details of this, but I'll just let you know overall that we did not find any of these biomarkers that fell on our conventional diagnoses. So the diagnoses of schizophrenia, of psychosis, of bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, were developed from clinical presentation. They were, they were never intended to be diagnoses that would represent brain activity. It, it was everybody's hope that the clinical diagnosis would pair up pretty well with the phenotypic diagnosis. And as it happened, that didn't happen at all. And we got a lot of data. We published many, many papers. But still, we didn't get a consistent story about a diagnosis being represented by um, an EEG. For instance, if, you, if you're thinking you have dementia, you can go in and you can get an EEG pattern that's specific to the dementia. You can get a level of cogn a cognition and cognitive de um, decline that would represent dementia. You can go and get a, an amyloid scan. You can go and get a tau scan. And you can see changes in the brain. That's what we're looking for. And that's what we did not find with, our, um, with, our, uh, with any of our measures. So in summary, we found many interesting associations between psychosis and neurobiological measures. That was really very fun. So in this study, we really, we really were able to see some neurobiology of these psychotic conditions. Um, schizophrenia was usually the most severe. People with a diagnosis of schizophrenia were usually most severely affected, but they were not different in kind than schizoaffective disorder or psychotic bipolar disorder. I should just mention here that we've subsequently done a short little study, by little I mean now 80 or 90 people, um, between psychotic bipolar and non-psychotic bipolar just to see if we could cleanly see um, a psychosis interface, and what we really showed was that psychotic bipolar, bipolar disorder looks most almost exactly like schizophrenia, and non-psychotic bipolar disorder looks entirely like something else. It's, it wasn't our business to find that out, but psychotic and non-psychotic bipolar are very, very different in terms of their presentation. Um, schizoaffective and schizophrenia were most oftentimes exactly the same. There was an unusual finding that we, a, a structural finding that I'll show you later on, that showed that, that suggested that bipolar psychosis was slightly different in its volume um, uh, than a schizophrenia like phenotype. So I'll show you that in the future. But what, we, but what we concluded was that there were no biomarkers, none of these measures we made, which reliably distinguished DSM psychosis diagnoses. Well, that was awfully difficult for us because we'd gotten together, we'd analyzed the data. This was an NIH grant, five years. We're, we're, we're at uh, three and seven eighths, almost four years. We have to, um, we have to uh, submit our preliminary data and make our plan for the next study, or otherwise we would just have to disband. So we're sitting there, and um, it became quite clear that our original hypothesis, which I showed you in that first very pretty picture, was not right at all. It was not even simply a little bit altered. It was completely wrong. So then we had to come up with another way of, 
saying, these data are still very significant. So we could, you can't go in a grant and say, we, we have all these um, interesting data. We have five sites around the country. We have very good site replicability and between site reliability and all of that. Uh, but we got some data and we don't know what it means yet, but we'd like to collect more. This is not the way to get more money from NIH. So we had to sit down over a day or two and make a, and make a story. I don't mean make a, an unimportant story, but we had to figure out what we were going to do. So the first thing that we did um, is that we pooled all, oops, just a minute. We pooled, I have to get the right button here. We pooled all of the BSNP data from the probands. So we took all of these 1,000 probands and simply stripped their diagnosis um, from, we, we, we uh, stripped the diagnosis from the probands. We had already, um, we, we had already differentiated them from healthy controls. We had looked to see if we could find biomarkers that were unique to their conventional diagnosis. Um, and then we carried out some multivariate integration. We had about 70 or 80 different biomarkers. Now, some of these biomarkers were not all independent. They were really clusters of biomarkers that, um, that um, represented one or another that, that, were, that, were, that, were, uh, that were organized together. So we did a multivariate integration analysis, and we found those factors that were independent for each other. Then we went on to another kind of analysis where we asked the question, are there subgroups here that are defined by biology that are not defined by, um, by, uh, that are not defined by diagnosis? And the answer was yes. These were the categories. We, these are the, the seven categories. Six, nine categories that we used, which were independent categories. These are all complex categories from those different biomarkers I showed you. And we asked the question that amongst the, our 1,000 probands, are there uh, clusters that look alike? And the answer was yes. And so we, we developed the, we just made up the word biotypes, and we called these biotypes one, two, and three, which isn't very inventive. But it was better than Taminga disease and uh, <laughs> any, anything else we could figure out. Now, this is what the numbers are that we, uh, that the biotype characteristics. But let me show this to you in a, in a cartoon. This is essentially, was, it was essentially our study. And this essentially is a kind of a su summary in very gross uh, pic pictorial illustrative terms of what we found. So we looked at schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, psychotic bipolar disorder. And when we looked at biomarkers, we, we saw these groups looked almost the same. So we just combined them um, into a single group that we called psychosis. Then we put these, the characteristics of these people through a kind of a, um, a, a prism. And that prism d differentiated these people by cognitive control and sensory motor reactivity. So this cognitive control is essentially all the markers we had for cognition. And the sensory motor reactivity was the different kinds of EEG biomarkers we had. And we found three different subgroups, one, two, and three. Now, uh, biotype one was clearly the people with the worst illness. They had the worst, they had the lowest ratings of anything. They had the lowest ratings of cognition, low but not very low ratings of cognition. And biotype three was almost normal cognition, which was interesting. Um, this is, when we looked at EEG, this is, um, biotype three had almost exactly normal EEG as well as cognition. Normal EEG, um, evoke potential, and resting state. If you look then at biotype one and compare these two graphs, you can see how low um, both resting state and evoke potential biotype one had. Instead of low, biotype two had high, higher than biotype three, abnormally high, um, a resting state EEG and evoke potential. So we had a kind of linear, in terms of cognition, we had a kind of a linear, um, uh, but with biotype one being the worst, Biotype two in the middle and biotype three being normal, but the best, um, it, that kind of continuum. But in the EEGs, we had very low EEG for biotype one, very high EEG for biotype two, and very uh, and normal EEG for biotype three. Now the people, the relatives in biotype one, had about the usual incidence of, of family schizotypal personality disorder that we're used to seeing in schizophrenia. Um, 20. 20, 22%-ish. Um, the, the, that same percentage, a little lower, was present in biotype 2. Biotype 3 had essentially no family 
um, it, no family, uh, no additional family um, interest in uh, it, um, propensity towards a psychotic or minor psychotic disorders. So we figure that biotype one might be the most, um, the most uh, um, genetic. Biotype three was really one of the biggest puzzlers because biotype, all these people, all these different groups had almost the same psychosis, so that they had the same level of psychosis. They were psychotic like doctors are just used to seeing everybody, and you could not clinically distinguish between these two groups. So what was this group? This group had almost normal cognition, normal EEG, normal almost everything compared to this group that, that was very, very impaired on their biologic measures. What, what was up with this group? Well, we were sitting around talking on this day. We were trying to think of something clever to write in our next grant. And one of the guys around the table said, oh, I bet these are the potheads. So we looked to see whether there was a differential use of uh, early cannabis and then chronic cannabis in, this, in biotype three compared to the other two. And in fact, in the first study we did, and we, we have more data now to reevaluate re it, but in the first study we did, these were the um, early cannabis users and these were the heavy pot users. Uh, not to say that there weren't other differences in addition to that, but that was sort of interesting. Um, here is, let me just show you, this is biotype one, this is biotype two, and this is biotype three. The orange dots are, psych are schizophrenia, the purple dots are psychotic bipolar, and these dots in between are schizoaffective disorder. <laughs> So you can see, you know, the um, biotype three has a significantly increase, a significant increase in um, psychotic bipolar disorder compared to biotype one. But you can st still see that in all of these biotypes, there's a good representation of all of the diagnoses. One of the interesting things is that the biology of the family members reflected the biology of the probands. Here's the proband. This is cognitive control. This is sensory motor reactivity that I explained to you from the other slide. All I'm going to show you is the pattern of these. This, the gray bars, the healthy controls. Healthy controls have a cognitive control um, right here. Um, these are the biotypes, and these are the family members of the biotypes. Who, um, and you can see that the pattern in the biotype probands, very low cognition, medium low <coughs> cognition, almost normal cognition, is really reflected in the, bio in the relatives, in the performance of the relatives in cognition. And then in sensory motor reactivity, here we have the healthy people in the middle. Um, I, I showed you that the biotype probands had very low activity, very high sensory motor activity, and almost normal activity. And the, uh, the, 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 res the family members really reflected that. So this gave us some confidence that we were working with a biology that stimulated this in um, relatives that might, uh, that might be important. Um, I'm just, we, there were various, uh, th this is the study that I showed you about, I told you about before, the vo volume, brain volume. It's known that psychosis has um, reduced gray matter volume in the brain. When we looked at the DSM groups and we looked at total uh, gray matter volume, um, the bipolar disorder and the normals ran exactly together. Schizophrenia and um, uh, schizo schizoaffective disorder ran together. This was when we divided them by DSM diagnosis. When we divided them by the biotype groups that had already been defined um, by the, uh, by the uh, cognition and by the sensory motor reactivity, we found a stepwise uh, uh, decrease in psychosis from normal to, uh, schiz for, to uh, schizophrenia on the, excuse me, from, no from normal through to biotype one, which is the worst. But if you look at, you can't probably see this very well in biotype, but there's a different part of the brain that's involved in the re reduced gray matter volume in biotype one, biotype two, and biotype three, and that's almost more important than these sum this summary slide. In biotype one, all the, all the gray matter in the whole brain is reduced throughout the whole cortical mantle. You see here, the yellow areas are the areas of reduced uh, gray matter volume, and that reduced gray matter volume is really throughout the whole neocortical area. In um, biotype two, which has a slightly better course, um, the gray matter volume is really localized to frontal, frontal and parietal areas. In biotype three, 
um, which is the healthiest, and all, all of these people are almost like normals. It's really the, the limbic system, a little bit in the, uh, in the frontolimbic system, and then in the hippocampus and in the insula, um, where the reduction in gray matter volume is. So I'll show you a few pictures about this resting state EEG connectivity. Now this is a this is a, this shows you the figure from normal controls, and this is connectivity simply between the 120 uh, EEG electrodes. But you can see the pattern of electrical con connectivity at the surface of the brain, and this is what it looks like in healthy people. If you look at the DSM, DSM syndromes schizophrenia, schizoaffective, psychotic bipolar, they look almost the same. Um, with some increased connectivity here posteriorly, a little bit of increased connectivity um, in anteriorly, but there's no distinction between um, these groups. If you look at the psychosis biotypes, biotype 1, biotype 2, biotype 3, um, you can see that just like the um, level of EEG, resting state, and evoked potential, in B1 there's a decrease in connectivity in B1. There's a tremendous increase in connectivity in B2. And B3 actually looks more like the, um, uh, the other diagnoses with some areas of increased connectivity. Now we don't know what this means yet, um, but we're, 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 we're looking to find out what this means. And we have groups that are distinct from each other in biology, as well as clinical presentation. Um, we asked ourselves the question, what's the best endophenotype if we wanted to do, say we were going to do a drug study. And we, had, we were going to do a drug study using clozapine in biotype 1, and I'll show you some data in a minute that suggests that. What should we really measure? So this is uh, biotype 1. This is blue is biotype 2, and green is biotype 3. And you can just ignore the dotted lines because those are the, oh, those are the relatives. It turns out that, of course, I just told you that uh, biotype 1 is worst in, in antipsychotic area error and in the backs, and in some of the N100, P300 intrinsic EEG activity. Biotype 2 is, has some decreases in um, cognition, but mostly increases. Mostly what they have are increases um, in these three EEG measures with normal people, with biotype 3 being almost normal. So where, where, where we are now when we started, when we were ready to start uh, BSNP2, we actually made an intriguing enough story about this to get our next grant funded. Um, BSNP2, uh, and so we, we didn't just say there's something interesting happening here. We said if you look at, the, if you look at psych, psychos, people with psychosis and if you make a clinical diagnosis, it doesn't give you a biologically consistent sample. If you, if you take their biology and divide them up, you'll find that they have very uh, characteristics here that are interesting. Where, wh what else do we ha have to do? We have to be able to replicate this data. We have to show stability of these measures over time. Um, do, these, uh, do these different groups have a distinct genetic fingerprint? Are there treatment implications? And then the path to neurobiology. I won't touch on each of those areas, but just a couple of them. I have to 1 o'clock, Martin? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so the replication. So what I can say is that with the second study that we're uh, doing now, um, we ha have essentially replicated these three different groups using the same measures. Here is a BSNP-1 study, uh, and it shows you the relationship of the individuals, each of whom is a dot, to cognitive, the relationship between cognitive control and sensory motor reactivity. In BSNP-2, this picture looks almost exactly the same, perhaps a little bit better, um, but it's certainly the same. Let me show you here. This is all the data from BSNP-1 and half of the data where we are now from BSNP-2. And it shows you again for biotype 1, 2, th 3, and normals, it shows you the cognitive control data and the um, reactivity data, which really um, biotype 1 and biotype 2 fell right on top of each other in these studies. We're doing a, uh, a stability <coughs> study. So the, well, one of the criticisms could be, well, you just collected all these data at one point in time, and if you collected them at two points or three points, they could be very different from each other. So we did a baseline BSNP battery on 
we're, we're, this number will be up to 200 by hopefully 180 maybe by the time we get to do the analysis and then we re uh, analyze them at, at six months and reanalyze them at 12 months. We've taken a, we haven't done a real analysis of this, but we've taken a sneak peek and that would suggest, that sneak peek would suggest that there really is a great deal of stability even in the EEG measures over time. And we've done, uh, just a G, we've done just a GWAS using the site chip. Uh, we haven't found a distinctive, um, uh, distinctive fingerprint yet for our biotypes. Uh, but we will, our real interest in doing that was, was to, our real interest in doing BSNP2 with 3,000 programs, is, pro bands is to try to get a, um, try, try to get an answer to that. We did find three genes that were of interest and they associated with different parts of the brain, the anterior ventral volume, these three all did in particular. Um, it, is, it isn't such a strong finding because it only came from an, uh, 450 of the, of the probands, um, but we'll look at it next time. You need really a lot of different, uh, um, a lot of different, uh, um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of cases in order to make genetics work. We thought a little bit about distinctive treatments for probands. It would be nice if we could, if we could show that there was a treatment that really advantaged, that was really good for biotype one, a treatment that was really good for biotype two, and then something for biotype three. Um, we looked at both, for biotype one, you might r remember that I said that the problem, the EG problem, is a reduction in, uh, a reduction in the intrinsic activity. And we had some of the people who were on clozapine and some of the people who were not on clozapine. The, this, the, this group of people was, uh, of probands was on clozapine, these were not on clozapine. And there's, we, I can't say that there's a causal relationship here because this is just comparing two groups, each of whom are, uh, the, the, each of whom are sampled at one time. But clearly, the, uh, the, the group on clozapine is, is a, the, the group on clozapine has a higher EEG than the group off clozapine. And that's true actually for biotype two, except that it's in the wrong direction. This is the, this is the increased EEG level, the intrinsic activity level of biotype two, and, and clozapine on top of this in biotype two makes these people, uh, increases their intrinsic activity. We would have the idea, and we would have to develop preliminary data for this, that clozapine would be uniquely um, um, therapeutic in biotype one, and biotype two, it might generate um, additional side effects. And the same, same is true really of Depakote. In individuals, Depakote is, an, is a drug that would be known to decrease uh, 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 EEG in brain. And here in, bi in biotype two, um, you see an increase in biotype two and EEG. And then on Depakote, you see a decrease in uh, intrinsic activity. And you see that same thing in, uh, in biotype one, except this is the wrong direction that we would hypothesize to go in. We haven't, done, um, we haven't done these kind of treatment studies, but at least these data would indicate that we should go in this direction. So one of the things that we really wanted to do is to, look, is to use these kind of data to look for a mechanism for psychosis. So we did a study with uh, Robert Gibbons uh, at the University of Chicago, a, a mathematician, and he, he used one of his statistical approaches, MIRT, to look for uh, psychotic symptoms that hung together, that, that, uh, that associated with each other. And then he looked at which regions the, um, the, that correlated uh, with these psychotic symptoms. And one might think, say that this could be the psychosis fingerprint, the fingerprint of these psychotic uh, symptoms right here. Um, you'll see in a minute why I'm very, very pleased that these all fell on the temporal lobe and then on regions uh, both in the frontal cortex and the posterior cortex that were around them. But at least this is one way to m move forward. Um, I want to tell you about a little bit of research that's in my own laboratory. Um, and we, in thinking about what is a mechanism for psychosis, what is a brain mechanism for psychosis? Is it a mechanism that's around the whole brain? Is it a circuit-based mechanism or a molecular basis? And the answer is probably all three, but let me tell you what we found anyway. This is my laboratory team that does the research that I'll show you now. This is a hippocampus. 
Um, we, we developed a focus on the hippocampus. This is, what, this is the head of the hippocampus. This is the tail of the hippocampus. And we, um, we recruit uh, cases, post-mortem cases, from the medical examiner's office in Dallas. And we, uh, um, we use the whole brain to do studies of the whole brain. But in particular, uh, we, we have developed a hypothesis and developed some interesting pathophysiology looking at the hippocampus and psychosis. I should apologize for this brain picture being so bloody, but I have to uh, say that when I give lectures to my uh, medical students, they, they, they hardly look at pretty slides. They only look at really bloody slides. So this is, this is really meant to get medical students to pay attention, none of which you are, I don't think, to pay attention to uh, th this. In schizophrenia, there, I'm going to show you this next picture first. This is, these are data from the uh, uh, BSNP study, actually, uh, looking, at resting st looking at regional resting state um, as it's plotted out throughout the brain. Everything you see in blue is a reduction in resting state, most, and in, in throughout cortex, both, it's, both the neuronal volume, the resting state, are all reduced. There's only one place in brain where resting state EEG is increased, and that's in the, uh, it's in the parahippocampal cortex, the medial temporal lobe uh, cortex. And these are data from our own uh, BSNP study. Uh, but these are, uh, there are also other data that I've generated in other different studies. This is the way the hippocampus looks in the brain. And it's usually in the anterior hippocampus, not the posterior, but the anterior hippocampus, where um, you see increases in, um, in, in activity. Um, in most of the, Brains and schizo most of the regions of the brain and schizophrenia, the activity is decreased in the prefrontal cortex, and most people study prefrontal cortex. Um, there was plenty of people when I started out this work studying prefrontal cortex, and, and the prefrontal cortex findings are very well defined. So I decided to move ahead in the hippocampus using some of the postmortem tissue. Um, this is what a hippocampus looks like. Uh, it's a very pretty organ in the brain. It's wound in on itself. And this is the dentate gyrus right here. This is the CA3 activity right here. This is a CA1 and the subiculum. So knowing that the uh, hippocampus is hyperactive in people with psychosis, um, we either, that could be either that the, that the um, excitatory mechanisms were elevated or that the inhibitory mechanisms were unregulated and that what we had to do, and, that, and there was a disinhibition. So I set out using human postmortem tissue, like you see here on the left, looking at markers for excitatory activity and markers for inhibitory activity. So what I could just say first, and I don't have a slide up about this, but I'll just say it, all of the markers that we looked at for inhibitory activity were the same in, uh, in the controls and in people with schizophrenia. So we found no differences in the hippocampus between inhibitory activity, between, yeah, in, 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 inhibitory activity. The first thing we, that we measured was, uh, uh, th this shows you the level of the essential excitatory subunit of the NMDA receptor, gluin-1. So this, these data would indicate what the activity in these regions is for of the NMDA receptor. The NMDA receptor is one of the most powerful of the excitatory receptors. Green is uh, normal, red is uh, schizophrenia. And what you can see is that in the dentate gyrus, in this area right here, and not in any of the other areas in hippocampus, uh, the level of this excitatory uh, protein is decreased. It was the first one that I had measured, and it went in the wrong direction. <laughs> Oh, I said, like many experiments in science, this was this is really the wrong answer. Of course, I teach my students data are data, and you'll it'll be most interesting if you just pay attention to those data, and that's how it turned out here. Then we took a look in CA3, and we took a look in CA1, downstream, downstream um, regions. Uh, in CA3, but not in CA1, we found an increase in for postmortem data, this is actually a big increase in the gluin 2B, uh, in gluin 2B containing NMDA receptors, and this is increased. So that this gluin 2B containing NMDA receptor is a particularly sensitive uh, a, a glutamate receptor. So we found an increase in the most sensitive glutamate receptor, but in CA, but, but in CA3, 
but not in CA1. Then when we look at PSD95, this is another protein that sits um, inside of the uh, glutamate synapse, inside the excitatory synapse, and it takes glutamate receptors and it sticks them to the postsynaptic membrane. So it increases the number of excitatory receptors at the, um, at the postsynaptic membrane. So you see there's an increase also, and again, a substantial increase in PSD95. So what was most interesting, actually, this would suggest that in the dentate gyrus, there's a reduction in excitatory signaling. And then something happens in CA3, so that re reduction turns into an excitation. And I just, what I showed you before were, were just measures of proteins, proteins that were associated with inhibitory and excitatory um, 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 activity. This is in CA3, and this, these data were really very interesting, and I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll just walk you slowly through the slide. This is a Golgi stain. This is a human uh, pyramidal neuron uh, in, the, in the CA3 of hippocampus. This is a cell body. These are the axons that turn into the axons that go on to CA1. This is what's called the apical dendrite. And right at the first bifurcation of the apical dendrite, this is right where the, uh, the, 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 the uh, afferents from dentate gyrus uh, synapse, right there. And this is the same thing in, a, in, a, in tissue, uh, Golgi stain tissue from people with schizophrenia. This tissue is just cleaned a little inadequately, so those blotches you see are just um, uh, unimportant. They're, they just, they're just, uh, um, yes. Um, and, but th this, is the, uh, this is the bifurcation of the, of the apical dendrite. And this for schizophrenia is pictured down here in E, and this for normals is pictured down here in C. And I hardly have to tell you you can just see the difference. What we found in schizophrenia was a real increase in the number of, uh, uh, the number of boutons. The, it, it, in each one of these boutons are located increased numbers of receptors, and this really is a reflection of LTP-based reorganization in CA3. So these kinds of differences between a normal CA3 and a schizophrenia CA3 really means that in CA3, in people with schizophrenia, there's a long-standing increase in excitatory signaling. So then we changed our whole, our, our, our whole hypothesis, and what we, our model became, uh, it, we take the dentate gyrus and we just de, we, um, deafferent CA3, and the deafferentation in CA3 increases measures of excitatory uh, signaling and increases uh, uh, measures, uh, increases a neuroanatomic reorganization for excitatory, uh, for excitatory signaling. Um, this looks, these data would suggest that if we simply uh, give a drug, levetiracetam being one of them, that would reduce uh, 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 excitatory signaling in the hippocampus, that it, we might be able to um, at least correct this defect and potentially correct what's associated with psychosis. We haven't done that yet, but we're really uh, st starting to do that. So then this is our overall model uh, is, is that there's a, a lesion, some kind of excitatory lesion in the dentate gyrus. There could be many different excitatory lesions. There's a decreased neurogen, there's thought to be decreased neurogenesis in dentate gyrus. There could be lesions of the gluin-1, excuse me, of the gluin-1 receptor like I showed. And this produces a particular kind of cognitive uh, dysfunction, a, pattern, a poor pattern separation. And we actually tested this in people with schizophrenia and found poor pattern separation. Then when, there's, when this inadequate afferent goes on to CA3 in this, just in this usual uh, trisynaptic pathway in hippocampus, um, the, the low afferent stimulation produces an unusually large increase in LTP and regional cerebral blood flow, and that is just passed on to CA1, passed on to subiculum, and then working in other circuits with the brain, we would suggest that uh, psychosis uh, occurs. So this is our model. It turns out that there's a, uh, there's a, there's a mouse model um, produced, in, produced at UT Southwestern, actually, but worked up in the Tanagawa Memory Lab uh, in, in, at Harvard. And this mouse model has a, a single lesion 
and that is a decrease in gluin-1 in dentate gyrus. It's an it's a, it's a anatomically selective uh, region only in, uh, only in dentate gyrus. So this would be really an exact match of what we were saying happens in schizophrenia. So we got a hold of that mouse, and let me show you just a little bit um, about what we found. Um, so it, the, these, are data, these are data from a mouse. I've, you really can't generate these kind of data from people. Um, but the, this is a mouse that had this gluin-1 lesion in dentate gyrus in CA1, just like we found in schizophrenia. When we first looked at this NMDA AMPA ratio, we found it to be almost zero. But that wasn't because some, something wasn't happening, but it was happening equally in the AMPA receptor and in the NMDA receptor. These are two of the most powerful excitatory receptors. And this is a measurement of EPSP, the excitatory postsynaptic potential. And it's a measure of the excitivity at this NMDA receptor in CA3. All of these are measurements as they're made in CA3. So the AMPA receptor is unusually um, is super sensitive. That it has, it has um, it, it, to the same stimulus, it will uh, give a bigger response than in the wild type animals, in the normal animals, uh, both for the AMPA receptor and for the NMDA receptor. Then when we look at the level of activity in CA3, um, instead of doing brain imaging in, this, in a little mouse, because that's actually pretty hard to do, um, we just count uh, CA3, we just count uh, CFOS receptors. We count, we count CFOS activated neurons. So CFOS activated neurons are increased. These CFOS activated neurons are neurons that are, um, that, that, are uh, high, that, that have a higher activity. The CFOS is a marker, uh, not exact, it's not the best marker, but it's, it's, it's a workhorse marker of increased, um, increased uh, activity, both in CA3 and also in CA1. This, act, this increase in activity, both in CA3 and CA1, is located in the anterior part of the um, mouse hippocampus, just like in the human hippocampus. That was a little bit of a surprise. We've looked a little bit in other brain regions and find an increase perpetuated downstream uh, to the amygdala and to the prefrontal cortex. And we find these increased cells um, in the pyramidal neurons in CA3, CA1, and the neurons in amygdala. They're not in the interneurons. Oh, wait, I, won't, I won't go through this slide, but just to say that we did various um, markers of, of mouse behaviors. Um, mice, nobody's really determined if, if you can tell if mice are psychotic, but they have some behaviors that are associated with psychosis. And those behaviors are all uh, evidenced by these uh, uh, dente gyrus specific gluin-1 mouse um, it, 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 right here. So all of this about the, uh, we, we had, I've been telling you all along what our hypothesis and what our model is. Um, but we would really suggest that reduced dentate gyrus activity is associated with poor pattern recognition, uh, leading to a reduced fidelity in memories, um, and associated with potential memories with psychotic content. If you take a look at people who are psychotic, and if you notice the content of their psychosis, the content of their psychosis is really like a psychotic memory. And they don't have new psychotic memories every day. I mean, most people, if, if, you, if you're talking to a patient and following a patient over time who has a delusion, that delusion will be pretty much the same day after day after day. Some, some patients would have, might have a delusion that their brain is positioned according, uh, uh, above the Mexican-American border. And it's giving signals to generals in Washington to keep track of what happens at the Mexican-American border. This is actually a true delusion. Now, that delusion cha changed very modestly after, day after day. And it, it, it wasn't highly impacted by the news or any other real events about the Mexican-American um, border. Some people have a delusion that they're being poisoned, perhaps that their mother is poisoning them. And um, that delusion is pretty much the same day after day. Hallucinations in people with schizophrenia are um, a little bit more fluid, but they're really quite similar day, day, day after day after day. So that it's not unreasonable from my point of view to think that the memory organ in the brain, which is the hippocampus, is, uh, is important in psychotic illness. And with that, I'll end <laughs> and take any questions if you have any.
Martin? So when you turn to the molecular basis of psychosis, you went back to sort of the traditional differentiation between schizophrenia and bipolar. But actually, you know, if you look at some of your biotypes, particularly biotype 1 and 2, they have kind of opposite changes compared to sort of healthy controls. So if you were to resort some of the findings, and I don't know whether that's even doable, that you have on the brains of these people in reclassifying them into the biotypes, what would you expect to find? That's a very good question. And we, you know, if you think about the hippocampus as a memory organ, the hippocampus is only an organ that makes memories. It doesn't store memories. So if you would hypothesize that the hippocampus would make a psychotic delusion, they wouldn't keep that psychotic delusion there. They would send it out to the neocortex. And then that the dynamics of the long-term storage and the re-remembering would depend on neocortical pathology as well as hippocampal pathology. So, you know, the EEG is all, EEG, I struggle, we had some discussions this morning in the imaging center about how you can't localize things very well. If I could localize an EEG signal to the hippocampus compared to EEG signals from the neocortex, that would be nice. A lot of the research on psychosis, excuse me, on schizophrenia and the hippocampus started way before we got these results with the BSNP study. I can go back now and combine, I can do psychotic bipolar people, and I can do people with a schizoaffective diagnosis. And I will, I have to do that yet with these people. But I haven't been able to do a retrospective biotype diagnosis. The biotype diagnosis is so dependent on neuronal activity and on cognition, both of which are just almost impossible to get in the postmortem tissue. So I'm trying to figure out now, if you have any good ideas, I'd love to have them, on how to look for postmortem changes by biotype. What we've done really is now we're making these stem cell lines. So we'll have stem cell lines from biotype one, biotype two, and biotype three. That doesn't, stem cells don't substitute for brain tissue, but at least they're a place to start. So how do you think that this dentate-gyrus lesion is related to other areas of the brain, like auditory association cortex or prefrontal cortex? Because isn't the dentate-gyrus, I mean, it's a primary recipient of a lot of cortical input to the hippocampus, right? So do you think that sort of everything is generating from the dentate-gyrus a focus of abnormal activity there, or do you think that there's sort of a broader disconnected circuitry that you're detecting in evidence of the dentate-gyrus? So in these studies, you know, the microcircuitry of the hippocampus is quite well defined, thanks to HM and the mistake of neurosurgeons. The primary input to the dentate-gyrus is from the entorhinal cortex, and I have a colleague now who's interested in the entorhinal cortex, so he's going to go back in all of this tissue, the human tissue, and in the animal tissue and study the entorhinal cortex. But all of the sensory cortex and all information from all over the brain gets funneled into really the parahippocampal area and then gets kind of condensed and sent through the entorhinal cortex into the dentate-gyrus. The dentate-gyrus is a part of the brain that's very sensitive to deoxygenation, and so during critical times in a normal lifetime, you could injure your dentate-gyrus pretty easily, which is why I, but I haven't focused on the other parts of that system at all. How do you account for stage of illness in the biotype? Oh boy, that's a real question. Essentially, the answer is that we have not accounted for stage of illness. Most of the people in the B-SNP studies have been mid-disease people, probably between the ages of 30 and 40, something like that. I forget what our average age is, but it could be 35-ish. 
you know, the focus on early psychosis now, both in early psychosis for treatment efficacy and early psychosis because it's a particular disease stage, is um, there's a lot of attention on that. And in fact, one of my colleagues is doing a, uh, doing a study where she's using imaging and using EEG, using biomarkers to look at very early psychosis uh, before the age, before two years after diagnosis. And she's comparing that to mid-stage diagnosis 15 years later. Um, this is kind of a hard study to do because people with psychosis, as you may know, don't stick around. You know, you, uh, uh, it's hard to follow them for 15 years. It's hard to keep your hands on them for 15 years. So uh, she's doing a study in two different groups and that has lots of troubles to it, but it's better than nothing. But there is a, uh, we do have to study early psychosis. With some of the older literature looking at different dimensional <coughs> aspects of schizophrenia symptoms, like the positive and the negative and disorganized symptoms, there was some old, older research that showed differential patterns of neuropsychological dysfunction among folks that manifested on across each of those dimensions. And with your biomarkers, I'm wondering, it, it, I, I'm not familiar with, with those, those, those cognitive measures, but I'm wondering just in terms of uh, being able to identify even further, uh, I guess, elaboration of uh, maybe being better able to, to refine the, the, the biomarker marker distinction between those three groups. I mean, do you have the capability of, of having, besides just sort of like an overall cognitive impairment indicator, I mean, do you have, do you have the capability of looking at executive function versus working memory versus new learning types of, 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 of measures? Because I, I would wonder, and one of the one of the criticisms of the RDOX is that it the bread is that, um, that it's it's very much emphasizing biological markers that are not readily available to clinicians for you know, various types of, of either treatment purposes or even diagnostic purposes. But I wonder, you know, the cognitive measures those are kind of a little bit more accessible maybe uh, in, in various types of, of clinical operations. Do you have those kinds of data available to be able to see if, if there's differential patterns of, of neuropsychological deficits that are associated with these different biomarker groups? Certainly negative symptoms are over-associated with biotype 1. So there's probably, there's a significant and highly, uh, I, 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 um, the size is, the magnitude is high of the increase in negative symptoms, in people with negative symptoms of biotype 1. When we look at cognition, other than negative symptoms, and that isn't really cognition, um, we don't find a differential uh, cognitive pattern over the biotype. Profile between those groups. Interesting. We don't know. I, I, we, we, were, we thought that, well, maybe we picked the wrong measures to do in biotype 1. So we picked slightly different measures of cognition in biotype 2. So we'll be able to ask that question over time. You know, there's, uh, speaking of like, in, in trying to understand how you would, uh, you would, you would uh, study this in a, in a, do in a doctor's office, or if, if, we sh if we manage to show some, some importance of this biotype distinction, how would you do this in a, in a, in a doctor's office? But there's all sorts of little uh, EEG type devices that are popping up now. I don't, I guess I think that the techniques will catch up to the knowledge if we are able to define some knowledge. My hope. Well, you've been a very nice audience, and thank you very much for your attention to these studies. <laughs>